You turn your Bible to John chapter 5. And before we go there, um, we've got... Um, We've, we've got our uh, seats all prepared on the plane. We're going to be flying out to Las Vegas, Nevada, Sin City, they call it. I wonder why. <clears throat> I think I'm fixing to find out. And um, we're going to be... Um, uh, Handing out, we've got, we had a uh, banner made for our table um, that goes along with the website that we put up. And my thanks to uh, Brother Stan, uh, who follows our ministry. He set up the website, did a really, really good job of it. And um, it's called ufopastor.com. And that, that just came to me. As I was thinking about that, because we're going to, you know, hopefully we'll be unique there. There won't be another, there won't be another table like us. Uh, I remember when we went to um, a prophecy conference down in Branson, Missouri. Um, our, and I took a picture of this and I, and I posted it. I still remember to this day. That our, that our table was unlike every other person's table there. They had the tables out in the, in the big um, atrium area before you went into the, the, where the conference was. And our table had everybody at it because we were giving away the videos. And I looked at all the other, some, the speakers' tables and other companies that were there, their tables. They all had credit card machines and cash registers and they were selling, you know, people would buy a DVD or something like that or a book from some guy. Uh, and we were giving ours away and people would be walking away with big stacks of them. And I took a picture of that and, and I said, you know, this is, this is how it works. When you give stuff away, people are drawn to it. And um, so I think our table's going to be unique in that they call it a, a vendor's table, a vendor's room. But we're the only people, hopefully, that won't be vending anything. Everything that we do is free of charge. So we have, um, I don't know how many different DVDs we made. It seemed like it was nine different videos that we made. And each one has about three or four different videos on them. So what is that? About 27 to 30 uh, different videos on related to the subject of UFOs and things like that. And uh, so we had a nice banner made up that's going to go across the front of it. Uh, I made up, we bought some nice name badges uh, for myself, Sweetie Pie, and there's uh, three or four people that live in the Lost Wages area. Uh, Olivia and Carmen, they've been here to our homecoming a few times. They're going to help us out. And um, so we appreciate their, their help. So we got them a little name badge made up for them. And I just want it to look nice. So we tried to do everything as professional as we could. Uh, but hopefully ours will be unique in that people will be drawn to it. Now, one of the things that I've been preparing myself for is if people ask what is on these DVDs. So I sent uh, uh, the DVDs out to Las Vegas um, for those who are going to be helping with our table. And I told them gals to watch everything on there. Try to memorize as much as you could. Okay. But that's like trying to know everything that I have in my brain. All right. So uh, for a few minutes tonight, I want you to act like um, you're interested in the subject of UFOs. You're at the symposium. 
the Mutual UFO Network is what it's called. They investigate UFO sightings, UFO landings. They investigate people who claim who have had encounters with these UFOs and so on. So I want you to pretend like you're somebody at the symposium. You see our table, UFO pastor, okay? So obviously it's, there's a religious guy standing here. And you're going to ask me a question about what I think on, on the subject of UFOs, okay? So I want you to take a minute and think of a question that you could ask me, and I want to see if I can answer the question for you without pulling out all my PowerPoints and looking at all my notes, okay? Go ahead, Matthew. You had your hand. You raised your hand, so... No, actually it doesn't. If you study the Bible, which we as Christians believe is the whole basis of our religion, we believe in one God. We believe that Jesus Christ created everything that's in the universe. And if these things flying around in our skies is real, which we know we have a lot of people, this whole organization, has researched UFOs, our own government has now come out and said these things actually exist. We're not just chasing butterflies and mylar balloons in the air. Then they had to have been created by God for a specific purpose. And if they've been created by God, then God would have put how he created them, what they are, and what they're here for in the Bible. And that's the things that I put on each one of those DVDs is what they are according to the Bible, um, how they can do the things they do according to the Bible, and, and the different types, of, even the different types of aliens that people said they've seen is actually in the Bible, and what they're here for is in the Bible. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? Go ahead. Right. Yes, I do. Uh, every Everybody knows, including J. Allen Hynek, who was the, 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 the top research scientist that was brought in by the Air Force. He was brought in with, for one specific reason, and that is to try to cover up as much, and debunk as much of the UFO sightings as possible. The Air Force with Project Blue Book was not interested in actually finding out what these UFOs were they were actually more interested in covering up what they were. The whole idea of swamp gas was something that J. Allen Hynek invented in his head after a mass sighting. I can't remember where it was, if it was in Michigan or Pennsylvania somewhere, but there was a mass sighting of a UFO. People clearly seeing um, this disc shaped object flying around in the sky and Hynek came up with this theory that methane gas coming up from the swamps, igniting in the air, and giving off this glowing light is what everybody saw. Incidentally, after Blue Book closed, J. Allen Hynek became one of the biggest proponents of the fact that there are, in fact, UFOs what he believed to be extraterrestrial uh, craft visiting this earth. Um, he was the technical advisor to Steven Spielberg for his movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind and he actually had a cameo scene in that movie. A scientist comes out, he's got his pipe and he's you know rubbing his, stroking his beard. That's J. Allen Hynek. So Hynek actually went around after Blue Book was over 
making speeches all over the country saying uh, some of that stuff I was forced to make up. These things are real. We don't know what they're doing here, but we know they're here. We know that they're not from this earth, and we, and we don't know yet exactly why the U.S. government is trying to cover all this up for us, but we, I believe they're still trying to cover it up. It's still a mystery, and it's intended to be a mystery until a certain day. I believe there's a certain day coming when everybody is going to see them. All right, yes, yes. I didn't hear everything that he said. Oh, there's no doubt. There's no, that's a good question. Uh, he's asking if men's, if it will be part of what the Bible says, men's hearts failing them for fear. In Deuteronomy 28, God promises, and this, and I've got a little PowerPoint that I'm, that I'm making up that's going to be just kind of be playing up up behind us, I'm taking a little projector there to just show slides of UFOs and aliens and the scriptures that I believe are connected to them. And one of them is Deuteronomy 28, where God promised that a nation of fierce countenance was going to come. And, and, I, and next to that, I have a picture of one of these big eyed, ugly, gray aliens that when people see them, it scares them to death. And I think that these are, of course, these are the two-thirds of the angels that are going to be kicked out of heaven. They're going to be tossed out of their first estate, which is heaven. They're going to be cast down here to earth. And when they come, literally men's hearts are going to be failing them for fear. That is a great question. Absolutely great question. That young man knows his Bible. Anybody else? Go ahead. Yes. Right. Gotcha. That was a question that I asked God and it took him, it only took him like, you know, 20 years to answer it. Thanks. Um, but when I got the answer, it made, it made all the sense in the world. Because I asked that same question. If these are spirits, and they are, even the craft, even the craft are because the Bible says in Ezekiel 1 that the wheels, the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. It made, it made them alive. Okay. Some of the UFO reports that I have heard was that uh, from former military people who have spoken out said that when, when these things would crash, they would literally, you could see a change in the color in them like they were dying. Okay. And um, Robert Lazar, who came out, was the first person to introduce the world to Area 51. He worked on these things out at S4, which is about 15 miles southwest of Area 51. Um, he said that there was absolutely, in the, in the craft that he worked on, there was absolutely no wiring at all. No wiring, no pipes. There was, there was a reactor in it. But there was nothing in that ship, no controls, anything that connected or that you would think of. It, like if I make this joystick go like this, then the ship will go forward. If I pull the joystick back, the ship goes back. There was nothing like that in there. So they figure it had to be operated on some form of thought frequency, which matches Ezekiel chapter 1. This Whichever way the angels wanted the chariot and the wheels to go, that's the, that's the way they went, okay? 
Now, if these things are spirits, my question was all, and I wouldn't talk about Roswell for years. If these things are spirits, angels don't crash. Okay? I mean, they're of a higher form than we are. They're a lot smarter than we are. They can see a tree in the way a lot farther off than we can. And they're not preoccupied by being on their phone all the time. So how can these things crash? And if these little beings on there are spirit beings, how can they die? And I remember I was up one night, one o'clock in the morning, and I was just wrestling with this in my mind. God, I, how, can I, how can I even say this if I don't have the scripture to back it up? The Holy Ghost quotes scripture. Psalm 82. Turn your Bible to Psalm 82. Once I, once, once he quoted that scripture to me, I went, that's it. I almost woke Lisa up. She wouldn't want me dancing on the bed, but. Psalm 82, verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But, Helen saw it before I even read it. What does it say, Helen? But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. That's exactly right. Ye shall die like men, and fall like... A prince in the Bible is a principality devil. Okay? So they're going to fall like the angels do. They're fallen angels. They're going to fall. So let's say that they're here in this, in this earth doing things they are not supposed to be doing. And um, God says, I'm going to get you for it. You want to come down here? Fine. You want to mingle with these people? Fine. You're going to become mortal now instead of immortal. You're going to die like men and fall like one of the princes. And there's a backup verse to that, Ezekiel 28, where we ha we're talking about the prince of Tyrus. And he says, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not a God. Same thing is said of Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14. It ascribes Lucifer of being this uh, anointed cherub and he's this high angel. And yet it says, art, art, art thou the man that did cause all this problem on the earth? So it says in, I got three witnesses in the Bible. You need two, but I've got three now that says these angels are going to become like men and die like men. And soon as I, as soon as I, that verse came in my mind, I went, that's it. That's the answer right there. So do I believe Roswell? Yes. And I'll tell you a story. Um, Jackie Gleason was a big time UFO guy. He studied, researched UFOs all of his life. Well, he was good friends with Richard Nixon. And him and Nixon were at a, at a get-together thing. And Gleason asked Nixon, what do you know about UFOs? And Nixon said, um, well, if you'll meet me, can you meet me in um, somewhere? I don't remember where the air base was. Can you meet me such and such place in a couple of days? And he said, yeah. He said, I'll show you something. So here's Gleason riding in the limousine with Richard Nixon, who's president of the United States, to an Air Force base where Nixon knew, and he had access back then. They stopped giving presidents access. But back then, Nixon had access, and, they gave, and Nixon takes Gleason into this vault where there's all this stuff retrieved from alien vehicles that have crashed, and inside this, they had these big pools of liquid where they had these alien bodies floating in there. And Gleason's like, and it just freaked him out. Yeah, from then on out. So now that, now that I have the scripture, I can, I can say without a doubt, I believe these things have happened. I believe it's true. And 
So with biblical answers, that's what I'm going to try to convey to the people who come by our table and ask any questions. Yes, Jaden, you're the last one. Go ahead. Yeah, there's actually, um, actually a story from the late 1800s, a small town in Texas where a UFO crashed and uh, they buried the body of the, whatever being was in there in the local cemetery and supposedly it's there to this day. I don't know, I don't remember what they did with the craft, but they buried the body there in the local cemetery. Yes. The what? I don't remember the name of the cemetery, but I know, I know what story you're talking about. All right. That was fun. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be trying to convert hardcore UFO enthusiasts to Bible believers. If we can. At least... See, you, there's always a way, there's a different way of planting a seed in everybody. Everybody's got their thing. And you get to know people and know what kind of person they are. God will show you how to plant the seed in their mind and in their life. And you just, once the seed is planted, you've done your part. It is always God who brings the increase. It is always God who brings the increase. All right, John chapter 5, turn there. Now, I was going to have Lisa come up here and try to answer these same questions. Nah. She'll say, um, you need to ask my husband. John chapter 5. Uh, we're doing a study of the gospel of John. Uh, let's back up just a little bit and get the gist of what's being said here. Um... Let's go to verse 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in that which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And we talked about that last week, the final judgment of everybody. There's a resurrection of life for those of us who are saved, born again, who died in belief. Uh, then there are those who died in unbelief, they, they have to wait. Their resurrection is coming after the thousand year reign of Christ. God will give them a new, uh, you can call it a damnation body. But it's going to be a body that will have to endure the suffering of the lake of fire for all of eternity. And in verse 30, Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And I want you to understand this. Jesus is about to introduce a clue as to who the Antichrist is. He's giving us a sign to look for. Jesus says, I've come, and, I'm, and, and if I came bearing witness of myself, then my testimony is not true. Don't believe me. I come bearing witness of my father. Whatever my father has told me, that's what I'm telling you. But if I came promoting myself, then I'm not the real one. And he said uh, in verse 32 then, There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. In other words, they went running to John. John, this man Jesus, is he the one? Is, since you've said, and we started out in John chapter 1, where we have the man who's crying, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, and he says right away, I'm not the one, but the one is coming whose shoe latchets I'm not worthy to unloose. So they went running to John. John, this Jesus of Nazareth, is he the one? John said, yes. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. Verse 34. But I received not testimony from man. But these things I say, 
that you might be saved. There here is a testimony to the, the doctrine that salvation comes through the word of God. Not through men's teachings, men's philosophies, the doctrines of men, the catechisms, the belief systems of man. It's not through anything that man has come up with. If, you're, if someone is to be saved, they must be saved by the word of God. These things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light. And you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Verse 36. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. And of course he's talking, number one, he's already performed the miracle of turning the water into wine. He's done some other miracles as well. Later on, he's going to do what could be seen as one of his greatest miracles. And that is, in, when we get to John 11, we're going to see him raise Lazarus, who's been dead four days. We're going to see him raise Lazarus from the dead. And everybody then, the, the fame of him is going to spread all throughout Jewry. And they're going to believe, at least temporarily, that this man must be the Messiah. I mean, who else can raise somebody who's been dead four days? Who can raise them from the dead but God? They're, and they're going to be blown out of their minds. So that's what he's referring to here. He's, he's saying, the things that the Father has given me, the works that I do, they bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Verse 37, and the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. And Jesus is talking to these Jews, especially these uh, rabbis, these Pharisees, these chiefs of the Sanhedrin, and all these Jewish leaders. Because for the last thousand, two thousand years, every time God raised up a prophet, the Jews had him killed. Or wanted to have him killed. They, didn't, they liked him at first, then they didn't want to hear what they had to say anymore. And then they had them killed, or they had them in prison, or they had them tortured in some way. And they didn't listen to what the prophets had to say. So verse 38, And ye have not heard his word, you have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him you believe not. Then he says, search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Now, I've had somebody uh, come to me and look at this. And they tried to. And, and, you know, I don't think they were being malicious in any way. It's just they didn't understand. They were trying to take this verse 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. They wanted, they wanted to add the word just, for in them you just think you have eternal life. They wanted to sort of take this verse and bring it up to modern times and how we use the phrase, well, you only think you're saved, but you're not really saved. Does that make sense to everybody? You only think you're a Christian, but you're not really a Christian. But that's not what it means at all. What he's saying here is, search the scriptures. Now, this is where it gets to your own personal salvation. Not the salvation that you think other people need. Not the salvation that you think other church members need. Not the salvation that you think your husband or your wife needs or your children need or your parents need or your whatever. Somebody you don't like. This is your verse. You and you alone are responsible for searching the scriptures 
so that because in them, if you will read them and believe them, then you will think that you have eternal life. I know this from experience. Having my faith tested, my beliefs, doubts entering in. I remember one day in particular, devils were really chasing me around. And I came here to the church, I dropped the kids off, and I just went driving around. I would go to the city park and just sit in the car and pray and read the Bible. And I mean, devils were just pounding on me. And it just so happened that a, a fellow pastor that I know, a friend of mine, called me that day. And I told him, I said, well, you know, actually, I'm glad you called because I'm... I'm not, I'm not having a good day at all. He said, what's going on? I said, I, I, just got, I just got devils all over me. I said, I can't shake them. They're telling me to leave. They're telling me to run off. They're telling me to go. And I asked him, I said, do you think I'm saved? He said, yeah, Brother Mike, I do. I said, well, uh, that's one of us. I said, but man, I'm sure having a hard time. Would you pray for me? And he said, yeah. And I can literally, I can literally remember the point at which I felt every one of those devils leave. Boom. It was like they were just all gone instantly. And I had experienced that before, so I knew what it was. And then at that point, it's like, Mike, why are you sitting out here in your car? Why are, you, why are you out here? Go to work. But I had to get into the scriptures and read places in the Bible that would reassure me that God's word was true, his testimonies were right, that if he promised me salvation, he was going to grant me salvation. And he was never going to change his mind about that. And that, plus the, the prayers that I had prayed, plus what other people prayed for me, I just, I guess I just resisted long enough to where the devils just left. God just said, go away now, leave him alone. He's mine. You can't have him. And I did. I literally felt it was just like a million pounds being lifted off of you. I've had that happen before then, so I knew what it was. I've had it happen since then, so I knew, have known what it was. But I'm telling you, whenever you're in doubt of, again, not somebody else's salvation. That's, that's on them. Your salvation is get in this word and you read it. I always tell people, go to the Psalms. That seems to be the, well, it's in the middle of the Bible, so it's easy to get to. There's just a lot of things in the Psalms that will help you. David's crying out to God all the time. I cried unto the Lord. He heard me. Um, Psalm 32, Psalm 51, others that will remind you of the condition that you used to be in, the pit that you were in. And how God will pull you out of it or God is pulling you out of it. Things like that. But it's searching the scriptures and knowing in your mind and in your heart. Thinking that you have eternal life. And here again, he's connecting your salvation with not what a church says. Not what that pastor said to me that day. He could have been fooled. But by what God says to you. And when God says it, 
No man literally can take that away from you. It's there. God said it. And it's there forever. So search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that you might have life. Jesus is just telling these guys the truth. Uh, here I am giving you the, the, greatest, the greatest secret in the world. I'm unlocking it for you, how you can know you can have eternal life, how you can live with God forever and share the, the most wondrous blessings uh, of of God's magnificent heaven, his, his greatest creation, how you can have that absolutely free, but I know for a fact that you won't listen to me, so you can't have it. Because you won't listen to what I'm saying to you. Verse 41, he said, I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my father's name. Let me back up here. I receive not honor from men. Well, does that mean that does that mean it's wrong to bow to Jesus? No, certainly not. We're all going to bow before him, cast our crowns at his feet. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But he's saying, just because men say that I am this or men say that I'm that, that doesn't make it so. It's what my father says about me. That's what's true. If my father says that I am your God and you are my people, then it's true. But man cannot set me up. Therefore, man cannot take me back down either. Everything that I am is going to come from my Father, the God of this, of this universe, the God of this everything, God of this creation, everything's going to come from Him. So He says, verse 43, I am come in my Father's name and you receive me not. If another, and there is the Antichrist right there, another, if another shall come in His own name, him ye will receive. And that is almost identical to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11. He said, I would that you bear with me in my folly. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, ye might well bear with him. In other words, I'm preaching to you the real Jesus, and you hardly listen to me, but somebody comes behind me, and starts preaching of another Jesus, you'll sit and listen to him for hours and take it all in. Those people in that Branch Davidian compound followed David Koresh, letting themselves be burned alive, having multiple opportunities to leave that compound. But Koresh... Koresh would gather those people literally every night and teach them almost the same thing every night. He had some deal with, with the seven seals. He had some kind of thing about the seven seals and that, he was fixated on that. And he taught them every single night about the seven seals. And they sat there and listened to everything he said. They listened for hours to this man. And the husbands in that compound willingly refrained themselves from their wives, giving their wives over to David Koresh. Stupid! How they followed this man literally to the gates of hell. And that's what Paul, that's what Jesus is saying. If another shall come in his own name, him will you, you will receive. Verse 44, how can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how you sh shall you believe my words? 
And I'm not going to get into this tonight, but I've done a little study into how the Jews interpret Scripture, the, the Old Testament. And they have, they have four, they, they say that there are four levels of understanding the Scripture. There is number one, the plain interpretation of what it says, but they say that's the lowest form of understanding Scripture and you won't get much out of it. There's a second and a third, and I can't remember exactly what those represent. But the fourth way to interpret Scripture is to basically forget the words of the Scripture and let, let a spirit give you a new revelation, a new understanding. In other words, it, doesn't have, it has nothing to do with what is actually written on the page. It's let a spirit come and fill your mind with all kinds of doctrines which don't match the scripture. And that's, that's what has gotten them in trouble for the last 3,000 years or whatever. Is that they've had the scripture, they just refuse to believe what it says. So he says... Um, if that's why he said, verse 46, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? And to close on this, I, um, there is a, a man that I am an adversary to. He is adversarial to me. Um, he is now out of prison. I don't think he's doing all that well as far as getting his ministry back up off the ground. But he was a, um, a Protestant associate minister, pastor of some church somewhere. But he said he got revelations from God about how Christianity is all messed up and we need to go back to the Hebrew roots of Christianity and we need to... We need to return Jesus back to being a Jew and think as Jews and see the Messiah the way the Jews saw the Messiah and use Hebraic words and all, all this nonsense. And I had mentioned him in one of my videos and, and accused him of, of, of believing a certain doctrine. Well, he called our office. He was up here in St. Peter's. He called our office. And left a message on the, on the voice uh, message machine saying that he did not in any way, shape, or form believe what I accused him of. And I went, that dirty little liar. And I went to his website and found it that he had written an article where he said exactly what I said he believed in this article. And it was that you had to say Yeshua, Hamashiach, not Jesus the Messiah. You can't say Christ. You have to say Yeshua, you have to call God Yah Yah Yahweh or Yahuwah or whatever. You have to use these Hebrew words for God. So I caught him red-handed. And I exposed him on, on a PMO that day. So anyway, I'm, I'm listening to him talk and I, and I suspect that he has been in contact or has listened to Jewish Kabbalah teachings. And he used the phrase white fire and black fire. And he said, we've divorced the white fire from the black fire. And I went, what is that? So I went digging and I found out what it was. It was right from Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah. They, they say the black fire is the black ink of the black ink letters on the page that the law was written on. That's the black fire. The white fire is the white paper that surrounds the letters on the page. And they teach that there's more to be understood about God from the white fire than there is the black fire. So it's like looking at... Everybody look at this. You see, you see this piece of paper here. It has no writing on it. This is... God, right here. You can understand God more by focusing on this blank sheet of paper than you can by reading the scriptures. That's what they believe. And I'm just going, well, that's stupid. It's idiotic. 
But that's, that's what he meant. That's what he was getting at. We've divorced the white fire from the black fire. And the white fire is the blank page. And you can understand more about God from the blank page than you can from the actual words that God gave Moses to write down. And I'm going, you belong in prison. You know what? So he ended up going to prison for stealing millions of dollars from old people. So anyway, um, it, well, let's, 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 uh, let's have our prayer time.